maybe I won't even tell you the year, but Chris Byer was a rookie shortstop uh, for his major league debut. We were sitting behind the Giants dugout. Willie Mays was in center field. Bobby Bonds was in right. Willie McCovey at first. Um, and Juan Marichal was pitching. So it was, that was my introduction to major league baseball. And I was a fan immediately, uh, at that point. And we went to a lot of opening days, which was terrific. Um, actually so much, uh, such an influence on me was major league baseball. I, I used to pitch tennis balls against our garage door and imitate Juan Marichal while listening on my transistor radio to the baseball games. Larry has stories about his transistor radio. That was mine, which was pretending to be Juan Marichal. Um, and then, you know, fun fact, when I applied to colleges uh, coming at, uh, in my senior year of high school, I actually, in my essay, wrote that I wanted to be the controller of the San Francisco Giants. And uh, kind of surprising that it actually happened Wow. But it was what I put in all of my essays. Yeah, that is, that's fantastic. I but I gotta ask, did you perfect the leg kick of Juan Marshall? I was not nearly as high as he was. <laughs> Get that sucker up there. I don't. And my first office at the Giants overlooked his statue, and the best part of that office was watching people try to impersonate him and falling over. I spent lots of time thinking while I was watching people uh, try to em emulate him. Yeah, a little bit like the steps in Philly when, you know, people yeah. try to run up like Rocky and they don't quite make it or they trip. Yeah, yeah. very much. Yeah, Susan, how about you? Your first experience with baseball? Uh, well, when I was a kid, my dad was in the Navy. So we moved around a lot. And when I was really little, um, kindergarten and first grade, we lived on Guam. We didn't really get any live television there. Everything was tape delayed. And I vaguely remember getting that they got the Super Bowl like a week later or something it was a big deal. But I didn't really know that much about sports. And then we moved to Alameda first when I was in second grade. And that was 1972. So sorry, Giants fans, you probably know where this is going. Um, my dad plopped me down in front of the TV during the 72 World Series and said, you know, this is baseball. He explained it very carefully. Uh, and he was really smart. He explained the importance of the batter pitcher matchup and kind of like the psychology of it all. And I loved it, I was hooked right away and it didn't, you know, we were 15 minutes away from the Coliseum. So 72, 73, 74, I just thought the A's won the World Series every year and we went to the Coliseum all the time and uh, it was kind of heaven for a little kid. So yeah, I was hooked from that point on and I did not want to be the controller of the A's, Lisa, but I wanted to be um, a baseball play-by-play -play announcer. So I figured I got, clo I got close enough. And you know, <laughs> Now that's happening for women. So we, you never know. Don't count it out, Susan. That yeah. it may still happen. It's <laughs> funny. It's funny you mentioned that thinking that the A's were going to win every year. I mean, kids who grew up with the Giants through the glory years of 10, 12, and 14 think the same thing. You know, they're like, yeah. what's going on? They're not, they're not winning right now, but yeah. they're turning back around. We'll get to that. Miss Clara, how about you? First experience with baseball? Um, I think my experience is a bit different in that I was a bit older my first memorable experience in baseball. Um, I'm a first generation American, so my parents didn't necessarily know the game of baseball or take me to baseball games on the weekends. Um, instead, my first experiences were with friends attending high school games, um, high school baseball games. We, uh, we had a pretty, pretty good team, Roro Catholic, and um, I had friends who were team managers and who kept score. So um, those are kind of some of my first memories. And um, I, I would say that my overall experience in sports is what drew me to my career choice. I knew that I always wanted to work kind of in the athlete life skills uh, area, um, maybe in collegiate athletics, but um, was really drawn to just developing athletes. So um, I feel that I found that working with the minor league players. Yeah, I'm the same as you just growing up at the little league field. Like that was my life every Every night, my dad coached. Every weekend, we were there, and my mom, of course, was the team mom keeping score. Uh, Miss Maria, what do you got on your first experience with baseball? It was only like two years ago. You're so young. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my first exposure to baseball, I guess, was when my my oldest brother took me to an A's game when I was like 11 or 12 years old, um, and it was the first time I'd ever attended like a live sporting event, and I was just like fascinated by the whole scene. You know, I remember we sat in like the left field bleachers and, you know, you could hear the, the fans with the drums and, the, and waving their flags. And I just thought the field was so pretty and so big and so cool. And I was like, so obsessed from, from, you know, from that point on, my brother had to explain to me like what RBI was, like what ERA was. And, 
you know, after that game, you know, I was, I really kind of became um, really interested in learning more about the sport. So, you know, I started reading all the articles. I started listening to games on the radio. I started watching them on TV. And at one point it occurred to me that if I, you know, if I were became a journalist and, uh, you know, started writing about baseball, I could go to all the games. So I just, you know, it just made sense to me to kind of try to, 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 you know, try to follow that career path and become a baseball writer. So that's how I ended up where I am today. Smart girl, very smart girl. Get a twofer out of that, right? Okay, so tonight is all about celebrating women's accomplishments in business and baseball. And Lisa and Susan, I want to start with you because you have the most experience in baseball on this panel. And I'm just curious what you would say, you know, the ratio of females to males was when you first began your career and how you've seen the gender la- gender landscape change over your time working in the business side of things for you, Lisa, and the reporting side of things for you, Susan. And, and Susan, let's start with you. What changes have you seen? Well, I, when I first started, there were a handful of women covering baseball. Um, I was the backup baseball writer in Sacramento for five or six years. Uh, we actually had a woman covering baseball at that point. Susan Fornoff was covering the A's um, in the late 80s. And, um, but then when I got a full, my first full-time baseball writing job was in Texas covering the Rangers for the Dallas Morning News. And I was the only woman covering baseball in the American League. Um, There was one woman covering uh, the Expos in Montreal and that was it. And then when I came to the Chronicle and started covering the A's, uh, Cheryl Rosenberg uh, at the Orange County Register and I were the only women covering baseball. So uh, it's come a long way. And I have to say, um, you know, Maria and Maria is, is, you know, an example of this MLB.com is one of the biggest reasons. They really made such an effort to bring in women uh, as interns, as writers, and the numbers like overnight when MLB.com started just exploded. So um, that has been the best thing that's happened for women in baseball, um, persons of color in baseball. It had been such a firmly really white male um, media scene. And that's just changed dramatically because of MLB.com. Absolutely. I, my husband covered baseball for a long time. Susan knows him well, and he was one of the only Latino sports writers covering baseball. And I will say this too, that, you know, there it's such a limited amount of jobs anyway, with, you know, such limited amount of teams. So when MLB network came to be, it created more opportunity, which has been fantastic. And now with blogs and there's lots of different ways to cover sports, you're seeing a lot more females have a voice, which is great. Lisa, how about for you in, in the financial side of things? Interestingly, you know, I joined the Giants in 2003, and I was actually um, surprised about the number of women that were in the finance side. Um, We would do and still do annual CFO controller meetings where the finance, the top two finance people in from each team would get together once a year and share um, experiences and best practices, et cetera. And the very first meeting I went to in 2003, there were four women CFOs, which I did not expect. And there was probably about 20% women in the room, again, which I really didn't expect. Um, today, it's, it's more like 30%. Um, and, you know, I also at the time didn't really expect, you know, where the women CFOs were in 2003, which was LA, Chicago, Toronto, um, and Texas. Um, so, and, and some of them are still in the positions and still there, uh, and long tenured employees. Uh, but, but I was really pleasantly surprised and, and it it continues to be an area where, um, a a fair number of women work. That's fantastic. And that gives us lots of hope too, to know that, you know, it's, it's an area where barriers were being broken long before we really knew about it and they still are. Uh, Maria, you're, you're fairly new to this industry, three years with the giants. And, um, you know, you're coming in at a time where we're seeing a boom for women in sports and the giants in particular hiring the first on-field coach. We just saw Kim Ng get hired as the Marlins GM. Uh, my question for you and also comes from one of our season ticket holders. We, Randy and I were like this, Randy club level 227. How far do you think we as a society has come in accepting? I mean, I know they're there, but are people accepting women as equal professionals with no gender differentiation, whether that's an athlete, coach, trainer, reporter? 
Where do you stand on that? I think the short answer is that we've definitely come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the Marlins decision to hire Kim Ng as the first female general manager was kind of like this huge watershed moment for the sport. Um, but at the same time, I mean, she had to wait a long time to get that opportunity. And she was basically overqualified by that point. You know, I think the, the New York Times had this really great story um, where they kind of looked at, you know, the, the previous 13 people who had been hired to run baseball operations were all white men, you know, before Kim Aang came out, came, came onto the scene. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just feel like if, if Kim, if Kim were a man, she would have gotten her opportunity way earlier in her career. So, you know, there's obviously been like this huge influx of, of women kind of getting coaching opportunities, including Alyssa Nakin, which has been great. But, you know, even if you look at someone like Rachel Balkovich, you know, she didn't start getting calls back from teams until she changed her name from Rachel to Ray on her resume. So, you know, obviously, you know, I think that we still have kind of a long way to go. Um, I think it's really great that we're starting to see kind of women break down some of these barriers. But at the same time, I think that there's still a lot of challenges um, in making women feel kind of welcome and supported, you know, once they are actually are in the industry. And right. I think that one thing that we're starting to see is that, you know, MLB is being a little bit more receptive to those challenges. Like I think they brought in Michelle Meyer Ship, who is now kind of the um, chief people officer in Major League Baseball. So, um, you know, they're starting to do things like mandating that all Major League clubhouses have a women's locker room, which, you know, sounds small, but is huge. It's literally creating a space for women in, in clubhouses. So I think that's huge. Um, and, you know, they're also kind of implementing things like hotlines so that women can go to if, you know, they're facing like harassment or things like that. So, like I said, you know, I think that it, it's, it's improving and I'm, I'm really happy that more women are breaking in. But I think that the, the bigger challenge now is kind of, you know, creating more institutional support so that not women not only enter the industry, but stay in the industry and continue to thrive and kind of climb up the ladder. Right. You, you want to be able to break in, but you also want to be able to succeed. And in doing that, you have to be accepted. And I think to, to Randy's point, I'm not sure where we are on that. And, and it's interesting, um, you know, that you bring up Kimming's qualifications, because that seems to be an issue as well, that there are qualified women that continue to get looked over and maybe not always as qualified men. So we need to be seen, uh, you know, for our qualifications. And if that means you're changing your name from Rachel to Ray, we still have an issue there. Maybe we shouldn't submit a name at all and just submit the qualifications and then see where we go with that. But with that acceptance part, Maria, that you brought up, that brings me to Clara. As I mentioned, uh, Clara, an All-American swimmer at Texas A&M. So she's a complete stud as an athlete. And Clara, I'm curious, how do you feel having been an athlete, you're, you're always an athlete, but I don't know if you're still active, how that benefited you in the male dominated world of sports, because I know having played collegiate volleyball, there is a, an understanding as an athlete going through the grind that you can connect with the player at a certain level. And so has that helped you be accepted when you are working with all of these men in baseball? Yeah, I, it, I think it has definitely helped me and it's been an asset um, to have experienced sports at a high level. Um, I, I definitely understand the drive to win and the team mentality of supporting the team and helping in any way um, needed to field the winning team. Um, you know, I would say I have a really strong desire, kind of like a level of perfectionism um, to quote unquote perform at a high level, like not on the field anymore per se, but, you know, in, in, um, in the office environment. So um, I think that's really helped me and helped me in a, in a competitive role as well. Um, as a swimmer, we trained really long hours. Um, we had two a days, three a days, um, long hours. So it was a good transition into baseball and having later evenings. Um, and then kind of also what you mentioned about just being able to relate, you know, day to day, I speak with, you know, multiple players and coaches and just being able to um, understand kind of the pressures that they're going through, um, you know, to make a roster or, or just what their schedules are like, being able to, to understand that and better, better able to serve both our players and our coaches. That makes a lot of sense. And the word I was thinking of with you is, is competitive. I, I feel like I have that in me too, from my background as an athlete, and it served me well, not in a negative way, just that you take that competition to anything you do, that you want to do it well. And I, I think that that serves you well. So I liked this question for all of you. And uh, Clara, let's just stay with you. It comes from Randy. He has season premium box lower 126. Randy, thank you for submitting your question. What 
woman or women influenced you most? And I do want everybody to answer. So uh, Clara, let's start with you. Uh, I would have to definitely say my mother. Uh, again, you know, I, um, I'm first generation American. So they came during a time where uh, it was popular to immigrate from China and uh, they didn't have the highest level of education and they worked a lot of long hours while jobs to provide for me and, you know, to make sure I was going to the best schools and, you know, had funds for all the different lessons and everything. So just kind of seeing that work ethic and, and um, the desire to see, you know, uh, your children succeed was something that has been very influential in my life. I, I feel like a lot of people are going to say their mom on this panel, but I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there. Susan, how about you? I would say my mom, um, but I also had a, an aunt who I love dearly, my aunt Elizabeth, who raised four kids and then went back to law school and then went and got her PhD and wound up running um, the law library at University of Pennsylvania um, in like her 50s and was just really, she was just a really inspiring to me. And um, I always found that amazing because I had a I had a much older parents and my mom didn't work and she was kind of the first person that I knew that had raised a family and then gone back and worked and I thought that that was just amazing so she was a pretty she was a pretty big and a big sports fan too so you know I, I always hit big, it off influence. With her. big influence yeah. how about you Lisa oh I had a mentor at Lloyd. Um, I, I hit Deloitte a little bit later than fresh out of college because I went back for my MBA and the woman, Teresa, that hired me, who was about the same age as me, was, was somebody who you learned from example, by example, watching how she acted. And the thing that struck me, and I, this was really the way it was at Deloitte, honestly, for me, because it's sort of an up or out culture, which I think from a training standpoint is extremely helpful. Um, is that you learn by watching people and how they manage people, how they manage up, how they manage down, and how much confidence they exude in the process of doing that. And, and, and I learned so much from working with her and from just talking to her and watching her act with other people in higher positions that it made it a lot easier, I think, for me um, to say, that's exactly the way I want to be, that I see it. I want to be like that. And I really did become like that. I mean, I'm, I'm not someone who takes things, you know, I take things fairly seri seriously and, but I do exude a lot of confidence when I'm dealing with anybody at any level. So, but I learned that literally from watching her do that there. You do exude confidence. I remember the first time I met you and, and I was so envious of that. I really, I really was. It's, it's such a wonderful characteristic to have. Maria, how about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my mom and my sisters always have obviously been very influential and just, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, uh, just, you know, showing me the value of hard work and all that. But um, I guess professionally speaking, um, you know, Marley Rivera is someone who I definitely looked up to a lot. I still remember watching like a home run derby. Um, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but it was when UN assessment is won and I remember watching her like interview UNSS but it's in Spanish and I thought it was so cool because I was like wow there's like you know Latina on TV like you know you know using uh you know speaking Spanish and using it to her advantage to tell you know these players stories so that was always uh you know really cool and kind of showed me that there was a path for for another woman who looked like me uh in this industry so uh you know obviously I got to I now know Marley pretty well um and she's been someone who's been really supportive and really kind of a mentor type for me so yeah she she's someone who's helped a lot along the way too. I love that you chose Marley. She's one of my dear friends and she's just one of those women who is always welcoming and sets the tone. She just makes you feel welcome. And I do, I want to mention in this too, you know, this is all about women, but when you said that Maria, it really strikes me because my husband, Paul is Mexican American and his favorite team growing up was in football was the Raiders. And that was because Tom Flores was the coach and Jim Plunkett was the quarterback. And he had not seen people that looked like him or were like him make it to that level and it stayed with him and he now covers the Raiders for ESPN but it's really important to that whole if you want to be it you got to see it and and I'm a, a firm believer in that as well and I do want to mention because I think the panel will all agree with this I, I too it's my mom of course my mom um, you know I feel like my mom 
gave me all these skills for life, especially as a mother and, and a friend and a sister and all those things. But a work mentor is Joan Ryan, who works for the Giants. And Joan, uh, talk about Trailblazer. <clears throat> she was the first female sports columnist in the Bay Area. And I don't know if you guys have had a lot of time with her. I know Susan and Maria have for sure, but Lisa and Clara talk about telling you what you deserve and how you should be and how you should hold yourself and carry yourself. Lisa, a lot like what you were saying with the lady who hired you. Um, so important to have somebody like that in our lives. And I'm, I'm thankful every day for Joan Ryan. Okay, so we get to take a moment because again, uh, we wanna thank our sponsor of tonight's event and uh, it's Pete's of course. So we're very, very grateful to Pete's. We love our coffee. And uh, for those of you who are on the go in the morning, I'll throw my hand up for sure. Pete's is joining forces with Beyond Meat and Just Egg to feature a standout breakfast sandwich. So I'm very excited about this. Plus their popular cold brew oat lattes. I'm really like, I'm going to go get this. They're being featured with vibrant spices and oat milk. So that might settle somebody's stomach a little bit more than other types of drinks. So we hope that you'll try these items at your local Pete's coffee bar. I know I'm going to be going tomorrow morning and anything to get out of making breakfast. I, I will do anything. So I'm going tomorrow. Okay. Once again, I want to put this uh, question out to all of you because uh, we have men to thank in our lives as well uh, for our paths. At least I know I do. And I think it's really important to acknowledge the men who have helped us along the way in our careers. Uh, for me, it's my father who got a scholarship to play baseball at Stanford and basically like made us watch baseball games. Unfortunately, he's a Dodgers fan, but he gave me the love of the game. And my husband, Paul, who's a sports journalist as well, um, I, I would not be doing what I do without his support and his help. There were many a night I came home from a Giants game in tears, not knowing what I was doing in this job. And Paul was there to help me through it and, and help me work through it. So I always feel like these events, they can kind of turn into a she versus he discussion. And I think we should give the dudes some props. So down the line, Lisa, let's start with you. What role did a man or men play in helping you achieve your goals? So I am the only member of my family that went to college. And the only reason I went to college was because one of the neighborhood dads hit me at, at 12 years old and told me that I was smart and that I should go to college. You're good at math, study accounting, work for a big eight firm at the time, big eight firm. He worked for Deloitte Haskins and Sells. Where did I end up working? Deloitte. Um, work for two to three years there and then write your own ticket. That is what he told me exactly at 12 years old. And that stuck with me. And that's exactly what I did. Although I spent 16 years at Deloitte uh, because I love the job so much. And, uh, but that set me on a path that led me here and you, you, you can't beat that. But it also just everybody for everybody on the call, do that for someone else. Because all it takes is for someone to believe in you at that age to say, yes, I should do that. And that, I mean, because my parents didn't, they didn't go to college. My sisters, you know, went to junior college and then did something else. But, but that was the path I took because he believed in me. So. Yeah, it's one thing to see the potential in someone. It's, it's another thing to tell them. Yep. And it can change their life, their whole, <laughs> their whole path. Susan, how about you? I know you're married to a fellow sports journalist too. You better give I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to say my dad, you know, because he did explain baseball and get me hooked. And he also did something else that was smart because I was a big reader. Um, he got me reading Roger Angel at a really young age, which, you know, it's kind of crazy to see, think of like a elementary school kid reading The New Yorker. But um, I absolutely was enraptured by Roger Angel, who's been my idol ever since. So um uh, you, you might remember a few years ago when he went into the Hall of Fame and the writer's wing, um, he came out of the Bay Area chapter because we nominated him, which seems crazy because the he works for the New Yorker, but the New Yorker chapter, the New York chapter would not get off their butts and put him in. So, so we did out of the Bay Area. So um, yeah, probably th those two are the, uh, my biggest influences. Poor Dan. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're <laughs> I'm going to give Dan Brown, Susan's husband, some props. He's a sports journalist as well, and he's a fellow Aggie. I have to. Oh, that's true. 
That is I true. Mean, he's yeah. kind of my guy. Yeah. And <laughs> fabulous writer. He is a fabulous yeah. writer. Oh, for sure. Yes. Okay. Clara, how about you? I feel like I should start with my husband so I don't get a bad rap. <laughs> uh, so yeah, definitely my husband. Uh, we have two young children. So he's always been very supportive. Uh, you know, he's got a big career of his own and, and travels a bit. And so he's always been very supportive and understanding um, of parts of the season that require longer hours and, you know, when I'm on business travel. Um, so her question, there's, there's just, there's so many, you know, working predominantly with males. There's been so many who have been influential in my life. Um, I think you obviously... I gotta um, give a shout out to those who gave me my start and who hired me, uh, Jeremy Shelley, who is our, our assistant GM, and then also Bobby Evans, who's our former GM, and um, uh, for just believing in me and especially hiring me at a time, uh, you know, roughly 15 years ago when it, it wasn't popular to have females in the front office. Great shout out, two great guys, fantastic. Good job on the husband too. <laughs> They deserve, they deserve some love tonight. Maria, who you got? Um, so I have to thank um, Richard Just, who's actually an editor right now at the, at the Washington Post magazine, I believe. But um, he, ran, he runs this, um, this program um, for high school students, um, a, a journalism program um, at Princeton, and that I got the opportunity to participate in. And it was really my first exposure to journalism. Um, and yeah, I mean, it really, it really changed my life, that program. And he's someone who, who helped me with my college applications. He's someone who helped me land internships when I was in college. So he was really kind of an instrumental person and in, in kind of, you know, allowing me to, to enter into the world of journalism and stay here for, you know, um, and I also want to, you know, there, there are plenty of people um, on the Mets feet who, who helped me a lot when, you know, when I, my first season as a beat writer, I didn't really know what I was doing. And, you know, kind of just help me guide, you know, help guide me in terms of like, you know, how to work clubhouse, you know, how to cover a team and things like that. So that's like guys like Mark Curry, Anthony DiComo, um, Mike Vorkanov. So they're all, all, you know, also people who, who are tremendously helpful um, and, you know, people I still talk to and lean on to this day. So. God, I would not go back to my first year covering the Giants for anything. I totally remember that first year. Like, what am I doing? Susan, you'll love this. I remember coming home, you know, crying. I'm like, I'm terrible. I'm terrible at my job. I don't know what I'm doing. There's no description. And I said, Paul, so when I ask a question and all the beat writers have their pad and they drop it and roll their eyes, do you think that I should have waited to ask that question? Ask that question. And he's like, yeah, there's a full on etiquette to how this works, but you don't learn unless, you know, you pick it up after a while with enough dirty looks, but he, really- somebody should have told you, I think, Amy, I don't think that's cool. They should have, they should have been after. a little bit nicer. Yeah. Well, he wasn't there with me, but um, yeah, I do. Re- I remember that vividly. Like they don't, seem real happy with the question I asked. Cause I took them, you know, somebody was probably like really injured or you guys were on a roll and I'm like, so what about, you know, this situation? And Boach was so nice. He's like, all right, I'll answer that. All right. Okay. But yeah, you learn, you learn you pretty do. fast on the job. Yeah. It can be really hard. Marie, I feel for you for those first years. They are tough. Okay. So fine, men out of the way, we got, we gave them love. Now let's get real because we got to be forthcoming with our audience about the challenges that we do face as women in this male dominated industry. And we can't break away or make any progress unless we talk about it. So, and this came from Scott. So I love this question. He has seats in premium lower box 114. What were the top two to three toughest challenges you faced in your career as you grew to the positions you're in now? And I'm just going to add to that really specifically, you know, what do you feel has been a challenge for you as a female in the world of sports? And Susan, I'm going to go to you with that. Well, yeah, I started my career at the Sacramento Bee where I was for six years and by, um, uh, by the end of my time there, I really, I had been the backup beat writer for baseball beat writer for a number of years. I really very much wanted a full-time beat. Our A's writer was Ron Krojcik, who's now also with me at the Chronicle. He very much wanted off. He was just kind of starting a family and uh, they wouldn't do it. And we both kept pushing. And I said, why? And they told me, well, we think you're too delicate to travel. And they told me they thought I was too meek, which, you know, me, Amy is pretty preposterous. Um, so I don't know what was going on there, but I think we could kind of tell. So I found a job somewhere else on the left 
And that's some of the best advice I can give somebody is if you are not getting where you want to uh, at your current place, put feelers out elsewhere because somebody else will appreciate the work that you're doing. And it, you know, it kind of went quickly from there. I had to go cover the NBA for a year, um, but that was fun. And I had to go to Orlando, which that part wasn't quite so fun. Uh, but it was totally worth it, uh, even even my two years in Texas. So to get back here and cover baseball, and to stay to, stay true to yourself, yeah, you exactly. Were, and exactly. what somebody said about and you that was so off. That was yeah, really, I, I am. By the way, um, women aren't too delicate to travel. I don't okay. know if people know that. No, they're not. And I'll tell you, I've had a couple knee surgeries with the Giants' doctor. Uh, the orthopedic surgeon, Ken Akazuki. And I think if he came on here, he'd tell you, like, he always says, you're way tougher than the players are. When I have to get shots and stuff, like, yeah, meek and delicate do not work. So exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I also wanted to ask Lisa about this because you have a really interesting take and it was very refreshing. Um, I, uh, now I'm going to try to remember what I told you. <laughs> um, I mentioned that you didn't really feel that you had to face a lot of challenges as a yeah. female. And I just thought that was hopeful. I, I didn't feel like being female was the challenge. Sports is a challenge. I'm, I'm sure anybody in my role would have had the same challenges that I had. Um, and the biggest challenge was not because I was a female and dealing in the male world. It was because I was an outsider coming into baseball and baseball does things the way baseball does. So I don't think being a woman played into it, but the most common thing that was said to me and Clara, you can appreciate this, you know, for the first 10 years of my 18 year career was that's the way we've always done it. (laughs) And I'm like, I don't care. (laughs) I don't care if it's the way you've always done it. We're doing it this way. So that was the bigger challenge. And I don't think it had anything to do with being a woman, but had everything to do with the fact that baseball is steeped in history and trying to get people to think of things differently was a challenge for a fair period of time. Not necessarily the case anymore. Um, I think the, uh, I know our baseball group is very open to and open-minded to doing things a different way. And I think that that actually bodes pretty well for what our future holds. Maria, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. This question comes from uh, Musuzu. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, Seats in lower box 121. I thought this was really interesting. What are the advantages of being a woman in the industry? And are there any aspects of your job you feel are easier because you are female? That's an interesting question. Um, I guess like one of the advantages is that the players like remember you a little bit more easy, easily because you're a woman and you know yeah. you stand out in the sea of men. I mean, that's, that's kind of like the first one that comes to mind. Um, I totally agree. Uh, I totally yeah, so, agree. You know, I think, you know, if you're ever like, you know, writing uh, a profile on someone and you kind of want to talk to maybe like their significant others, maybe they'd feel a little more comfortable sharing like their, their wives or their girlfriends numbers with a woman also, but you know, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many advantages there actually are, to be honest. <laughs> well, I just think it puts you in a different light. And here, here's what I'll say. I'll add on to that. You might get noticed first or they may come to you because you're female and they might think, oh, you're delicate or meek. Right, Susan? But they don't come continue to come talk to you if you don't know what you're talking about. So that's some of the advice I always try and pass down to college, you know, women, young women who are like, I want to be on TV. I want to, I want to cover sports. That's not what it's about. It's not about being glamorous. It's about knowing what you're doing, because if you don't, you lose them and they're gone for good. So the ones that stay for a long time, you know, Maria is fairly new into this, but has already established such a, 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 a true respect for your reputation. And Susan, I mean, forget about it. It's because you've proved, you know, what you're talking about. And that's the most important thing I think you can do as a female, because you don't have the room for air. That Yeah. Um, I think that's very true. Um, I, you definitely need to know what you're talking about and usually much more so than guys do. I've, I've, I've heard male reporters say the stupidest things, uh, not necessarily the print people, but sometimes the radio people and 
uh, at others. Um, and they get away with it. Like nobody notices. But if, if I said it or Maria said something, you know, preposterously wrong, um, they'd be like, oh, well, it's because they're a woman. And we all say dumb. We all ask dumb questions now and then. It's impossible not to. It happens. But we really have to make sure that ours are very limited for that reason. Um, and you have to pay attention. You know, you have to love it. You have to pay attention. Uh, and those are the, the keys to, to longevity, but also just to be, to be able to do the job well. And that's, you don't always see that. And, and I mean, really more from the men than from the women. I know. Well, and I always joke, you know, that, uh, you know, a lot of the beat writers that are men never played. And so like being an athlete, like Clara comes in, she was an all American. Like, I'd love to see Clara take on a couple of the guy beat writers. Cause I, I think she crushed them. Like there's a physical, uh, you know, legitimacy to being there as well. And, um, that sometimes gets overlooked. So Clara, I'm going to set that up. I'm going to pick up a couple beat writers for you. Just put a little, you know, one-on-one game going, and <laughs> put you in the batter's box. Cause I think you would crush it. Uh, okay. So this is, this is one from me because I definitely feel it in my side of the industry that women are guilty of not supporting other women. We don't do a great job of supporting each other. I think it's getting better, but I know in my little section, it's very competitive. It's very territorial and it's very insecure. Everybody's worried that somebody's coming up behind them. Uh, age sets in, you know, all, all kinds of stuff happens. If you, you start making too much money, they can get somebody who does it for less. There's all kinds of things I've been told. The best was we can find somebody to do this for a lot less. That, that was great. Um, and then I looked at what I made. I should have shown it to you, Lisa. And, and <laughs> had you give me your opinion about it. So panels like this, fantastic start. There is definitely power in numbers and the more of us, the better. Um, Lisa, I'm going to start with you. Why do you think women struggle to support each other? And what do you do to pay it forward and, you know, be a mentor like you had with the boss that hired you? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because that was just something that's ingrained in the public accounting culture, at least at Deloitte, where they actually built in mentors. So when you hit manager role after five years, you were assigned mentees and advisees so that the people who are brand new coming in were dealing with somebody who had five years of experience and could advise them throughout their, for their career. And that process actually was super helpful to whoever, you know, you ended up assigned. And, it, and if you were good at it, you'd end up with more than other people. And, you know, people would rotate in and out as to who your advisees are. When I moved over to baseball and industry, you know, A, I, I don't have a lot of time for it. But I really, that was an aspect of my job I really liked. But it was kind of programmed into the job in, in, that, in that sense. So time is a factor. Um, and then I do actually really like the fact that there's a specific existing program because it is something I'm good at. I mean, my last job at Deloitte, you're going to love this, was goddess of career development. Like that was my actual title. I still have the business cards. And that's really what I did uh, before I came to the Giants. And, and it's because I'm honest with people, you know, I don't pull any punches, you know, and I tell them what they really need to know. And I still enjoy doing that. I will take the odd, you know, LinkedIn, you know, meeting request to do, I'd like to do an informational interview and I'm doing a little bit more with it within the giants as well, but it really is a factor of time. And how do you fit that in and make it meaningful for people? Um, I think is the biggest challenge. And, and important to make time too. You know, I, I think about all the people who made time for me while I was coming up and, and asking for those informational interviews. And I get asked all the time, students I'm teaching at Sonoma State, do you have time? Yep. We'll figure it out. We'll yeah. figure it out. Yeah. Clara, you, I want to bring you in on this because you, again, gave me some hope in where this is going. And will you just kind of share your experience on, on women supporting women in, in your role? Definitely. So when I first read this question, I, I thought this would be one, it, it just didn't resonate with me. So I thought it would be one that you would, that maybe you could pass on for me, but uh, you know, and it's I a hard one for me. Answer it. 
<laughs> it's a hard one for me to answer in my shoes because I've always rooted for women. Like I've, I've always wanted that camaraderie and to have someone else in my department or, or, or just to see, you know, women in baseball operations to be normalized. So I've, I've always rooted for women and, you know, in the sense of when we're, you know, when we're doing a lot of our pipeline positions during the onboarding, during the recruiting, I spend a lot of extra time with our female candidates, you know, if there's any hesitation about working in a predominantly male dominated environment, you know, I've, I'm, you know, I'm there to help talk them through it, to talk, you know, in an honest way, transparent and talking about my experiences and the support that we do have. And um, so I really take pride in that. And then, um, you know, I think I especially keep an eye, you know, as a, a lot of times we get, we get emails from other clubs that say, you know, if, if staff has been let go and if they'd like to stay in baseball and, you know, I'll take a look at those lists and I definitely kind of keep an eye out if there's any females on the list and we'll try to reach out and, and um, you know, do that informational interview or, or, you know, if we have any openings to try to see if it would be a good fit. Yeah. I, I feel like between you and Lisa, that what sticks out and you actually said it, Clara, is transparency. And that's the best thing we can do for women coming up behind us or asking us for advice is to be transparent and really honest about the experiences so that they know what they're getting into. Uh, let's take another minute to thank our sponsor, Pete's Tonight. I hope that you will download the app because it's amazing. Again, you get special deals on spring items like their plant-based drinks, like that cold brew oat latte that I'm having tomorrow morning. And don't forget that they now deliver. This is amazing. So ladies, we got to figure out how they're going to deliver to Oracle Park. That's, that's what we're going to figure out how to do. And lastly, please don't forget that we'll be calling out today's winners, I guess tonight now, tonight's winners for being here, you were entered to win a Pete's gift card and two bags of the Pete's 2021 anniversary blend. Again, a 100% women produced coffee. So you know, it's going to be delicious. All right. We're on our last round of questions as we're getting to wrap up our evening. And uh, again, to Lisa and Clara, not to, to pick on you, but this is really important. And Dwight lower box 105. I hope he's still in here. Uh, he said, are the giants better than other other baseball or sports teams with regard to their inclusion of women. And I thought that was fascinating because covering the Giants for so long, they're certainly a very progressive organization. So uh, Lisa, let's start with you. So I, so just from a big picture standpoint, our organization, about half of our front office and our seasonal staff are women. Um, on a year over year basis, we're one of the top clubs with the highest percentage of women in baseball. Uh, on the business side, women make up 30% of our leadership team, and women are represented at every level of our organization. Um, our internal pipeline for leadership positions is strong and almost 50 women in director and manager level positions. And then within baseball and business, 40% of the women at the Giants are racially and ethnically diverse. I'm going to let Clara speak to baseball because, you know, there are constant changes happening on the baseball side, but... I even just looked at my own department within finance. I have, um, including me, 17 people, 10 women, seven men, and 41% diverse, which is not too bad. That's great. That's great. Claire, what, what would you like to add? Just your thoughts on, on the inclusion of the Giants. And I'm guessing there's a, a pride factor in working for the Giants in the, in the numbers that Lisa just, just told us. Absolutely. Um, without knowing the exact rosters of staff for other clubs, I do feel that the Giants are very progressive and well represented, especially after Lisa reading the stats that were, you know, roughly 40 percent, 40 to 50 percent um, being women in the front office and other roles. Um, you know, so that's near half half in a game that is predominantly played by only men. So, um, you know, I do feel that being in the Bay Area probably breeds having more women in the workplace in general. Um, you know, for example, I don't, you know, if stats show in the South, maybe there's not as many households with two incomes. Um, I do want to, you know, highlight in the baseball operations department uh, under Farhan that we have just exploded with females in the last couple of years. And these, these aren't just in the administrative roles, you know, obviously we see Alyssa Nakin, uh, but we also have uh, areas, you know, such as strength and conditioning. We've had female trainers. Um, we have females in the EAP who support players and work with players directly on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so a lot of different roles where where uh, women are working directly with the players and coaches. 
You kind of read my mind saying the Bay Area because I wanted to bring Susan and Maria into this and see if you can add on uh, comparing the diversity of the Bay Area media versus media in other parts of the country because you both have been to plenty of places outside of the Bay Area. What are your thoughts on that, Susan? Well, you know, this is, you mentioned Joan Ryan. Joan Ryan and Stephanie Salter were two of the first women covering sports in the country. Um, Susan Fornoff was one of the first women covering baseball full-time in the country. Uh, so there, there's been a long standing tradition of a really um, talented women in the print media here, obviously also on, on TV. Um, you know, and it's, con it's continued right on, you know, Gwen Knapp and Ann Killian now at the Chronicle. Um, when I was in Dallas, it was not the case. Um, I recall my, <laughs> he'd actually hired me. And as I was walking across the newsroom on my first day at the Dallas Morning News, the sports editor yelled across the newsroom, my, my golf pro wants to know what I'm doing and hiring a woman to cover baseball. So it is, now that was in the 90s. Um, hopefully things have changed. Um, and I do have to say the Rangers for the first time this year now have a woman and a woman of color covering the Rangers. So I think things are changing. Uh, and that makes me very happy. <laughs> that makes me happy too. Not that that guy said that though. Somebody should just go smack him up. Yeah, said. he hired me. I was like, why'd you hire me? We can't oh, do weird. that. We'd get in trouble. <laughs> so Maria, how, how about you? What have you seen in your travels? Yeah, I mean, I was fortunate enough to grow up in the Bay Area, which obviously had a very, very strong female presence, um, just in terms of baseball coverage was like Susan, Jane Lee, Amy, you and, you know, Janie, um, obviously, there are a lot of women covering the sport. So it didn't seem like far fetched for me to, to you know, become a baseball writer. Um, you know, when I was in, when I covered the Mets, um, Christy Ackert was on the Mets beat. So, you know, um, it, again, I wasn't like the only one in the clubhouse at that point. Uh, you know, when I switched to, to the Angels, I was the only um woman covering the team full time. So yeah, I mean, you know, there were times where we'd be on a road trip and I'd be like the only woman in the press box and I mean, there's like 50 people in there. But yeah, I mean, I think that the numbers have been, have really been increasing in recent years. So it's really encouraging. It makes you feel a little less isolated, a little less alone. So it's always great to see that, that, you know, the, that, you know, the representation is, is really getting a lot better. So we're at the end of our show. We have one final question for all of you. And I love this question. Again, it came from Scott club level two, two, four. Thank you for submitting all the questions for the season ticket holders that participated tonight. We really appreciate your voice and your inquisitiveness. And uh, Scott would like to know for young women who have an interest in the baseball industry, whether that's the business side or the reporting side or the internal side like Clara, what piece of advice can you share that you wish you had received when you started, but only learned through experience? Lisa? I, you know, I feel like I was lucky <laughs> to get the job. If I really look back on it, you know, I was involved in saving the team from, you know, moving and I'm, I'm a longtime season ticket holder. So I take that very personally. Um, but I, you know, I was involved with the Giants since 92 on the audit side. And then I continued to work at Deloitte and they were my client. The Giants were my client. And just by virtue of connecting with people at the club, them knowing who I am and knowing what my skills were. When the job opened up, I had the opportunity. Not only did I have the opportunity, they called me and said, do you want it? Do you want the job? Which is almost unheard of. Um, so again, I kind of feel like right place, right time. But the truth is, if you build your skills on the outside and people know, you know that you have those skills, that outside experience is super valuable to a sports club, a baseball club. And so to the extent that you can continue to build your skill and then just Keep your eye open for the opportunities when they do come up because they don't come up that often um, and stay connected to people in the organization. Then you'll have the opportunity to jump on it and have built the skills that will be valuable to the club. It's the best advice I could give. Great advice. Maria, how about you? Um, I would just say like be proactive and seeking out mentors because I feel like it's really important to have people that you can kind of lean on, um, you know, when, when you, when you feel like you need a little guidance, um, you know, it's, it's, like I said, this could be a very isolating job sometimes. So it's, it's really good to kind of have someone who you can bounce ideas off of and, you know, run things by and maybe like get a little inspiration from here and then. So yeah, just uh, having, you know, 
you know, find someone whose work you really admire or something and reach out to them because more than often than not, they're going to be really happy to help you out. So, uh, you know, I think writers are always trying to pay it, pay it forward for kind of like the, you know, the next up and coming people. So, um, so yeah, I think that that's really important to feel like you have someone in your corner and someone who's going to be rooting for you and supporting you along your journey. Yeah. Clara? I like to share with job seekers, uh, and it's been said a couple times on here that, you know, people who want to major league positions, the positions are really rare. There's only essentially 30 in the world. So to try to just gain experience anywhere you can, whether that's working at a minor league affiliate, working independent league ball, working at the high school level, any kind of way that you could, you know, be around the game and absorb the game, you'll learn more about the business of baseball and it'll help you that much more as you seek a job within major league baseball. And Susan? Well, I'm glad you said, Amy, um, something that you would you wish you would have known, because I, I think this this tends to be a thing for a lot of women. I think women need to be better at self-promoting. And I wish I had been better at self-promoting. Um, you know, they, they, they told me that I was too meek. I was not too meek. I'm definitely not meek. But I was not doing what a lot of the men in the department were doing, which was telling everybody how great I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, which it just doesn't come naturally, I think, as naturally as it might to, to men. Don't be afraid to let people know that you're good at your job. Um, you don't necessarily have to broadcast it with a you know, megaphone or anything, but you know, the confidence like Lisa was talking about, that's important, but a little bit of self-promotion can go a long way. It absolutely. Oh, you can do it on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, and you have all kinds of places to say how great you are. So make sure you use them all. Ladies, thank you. I am so impressed with all of you. I've so enjoyed working with all of you over the years, and it was a true honor to host this panel this evening. A huge thank you to Pete's Coffee for sponsoring this event. These don't happen without help from corporations. So thank you, thank you. And I will be going tomorrow morning. I'll post it on my Instagram that I went and got the oat latte. And uh, Susan Flesser of The Chronicle, Maria Guardado of MLB.com, Lisa Pantages and Clara Ho of The Giants. You simply are the best. Thank you for taking the time to do this. All right. So prize winners. This is the best part. We get to announce our prize winners and uh, you're going to get a Pete's coffee gift card and two bags of the Pete's 2021 anniversary blend. Again, 100% women produce coffee and here you are. So get ready for your name. Anne Nutting. Anne Nutting, you're a winner. Jeff Lamb. Jeff Lamb's a winner. Linda McGuire, going home a winner tonight. Linda McGuire, Nancy Bardoff, the Giants won last night. You win tonight, Nancy. Way to go. And Reggie Hamilton. So once again, Ann Nutting, Jeff Lamb, Linda McGuire, Nancy Bardoff, Reggie Hamilton. Congratulations. Enjoy your Pete's coffee. And thank you so very much for joining us this evening. It has been a pleasure. And we'll see you at the